technical supervisor for Idaho Fish and Game out of Idaho Falls. Um, I'm currently the chair of this committee. Um, just want to give a few quick announcements before we go go around and introduce ourselves. Um, we are recording this, just so everyone's aware. This is being recorded and it is available to the public online. Um, I emailed the committee this morning, but do want folks to know that there was a slight tweak to our schedule, which is also reflected online on the on the website. Um, we just we switched a few things from between the two days. Um, also, a slight change: the executive session. Uh, we will be be meeting tomorrow in this room at 8, 8 a.m. as opposed to 8.30, so we'll be in here at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, because we are recording this and folks can watch at home, we're using the owl here, so just kind of try to remember to speak clearly and loudly so that folks can hear and so that the audience can hear as well, best we can there. Uh, folks from the public that are here, if you would like uh, to provide public comment during the public comment period, there's a roster in the back of the room that you can go ahead and sign up on. And we will uh, turn you up in the order that you signed up for. So that's in the back of the room. Also, anyone who is doing a presentation, if you have a PowerPoint that you'd like to use, um, get with James if, if you haven't already. James Brower is sitting up in the corner here and we can get you loaded up onto the machine. Um, so I think if we could just start around the table here and have the committee introduce themselves. Frank, do you want to start? Sure. Um, Frank Doman, I'm team leader of the interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team with the U.S. Geological Survey uh, based here in Bozeman. And I'm Rick King. I'm chief of the Wildlife Division for Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Afternoon, Chad Hudson, the Forest Supervisor for the Bridger Teton National Forest. Uh, Chip Jenkins, Superintendent of Grand Teton National Park. Jennifer Carpenter, I'm the Chief of the Yellowstone Center for Resources, representing Cam Shelley today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Erickson, Forest Supervisor for the Custer Gallatin National Forest, based here in Bozeman. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mel Bowling. I'm the Forest Supervisor of the Caribou Thar Yee National Forest and Curlew National Grassland in Southeastern Idaho. Hi, Ken McDonald. I'm the Chief of the Wildlife Division with Montana Fish, Life, and Parks at Helen. Pat Marsh, uh, District Manager, Wind River, Bighorn Basin District in Moreland, Wyoming. Dylan. Uh, Danielle Euler, I'm the Wildlife Stewardship Outreach Specialist at Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Service and Advisor to this committee as the Chair of the Information Education. Good afternoon, everyone. Leslie Crossland, I'm the First Supervisor on the Shoshone National Lee Livingston, Park County Commissioner of Cody, Wyoming. Looks like I made it just in time. Glad to have you. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Mary Diversa, I'm the District Manager for the Idaho Falls District, Bureau of Land Management with the Field of Idaho. And just to share, um, Katie Stevens, my Montana counterpart, who's the District Manager for Montana District and Montana BLM Rep to this committee, had a conflict and was not able to make it today. For your awareness. Hi, I'm David Diamond. I'm the coordinator for the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Fisher. I'm the acting state supervisor for the Fish and Wildlife Service in Idaho. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Timchuk. I'm the forest supervisor on the Beaverhead Deer Lodge just out of beautiful Dillon, Montana. Uh, hello, Adam Surrenner. I am the Montana Ecological Services Field Office Fish and Wildlife Service supervisor. Good afternoon, everybody. Tyler Abbott. I supervise the Wyoming Field Office for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm Hillary Cooley, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Visitor Recovery Coordinator, advisor on the Thank you. I, I think we, we'd like to go around the room and if folks can, we can just start in the front row and just briefly introduce yourself, just uh, name, affiliation, and what town you're from. But if you have comments, we'll do those later. Right now, it's just about who you are and where you're from. Yep. Um, I'm Julia Randall. Uh, I'm um, president of Wildlife Restoration Foundation. I'm Sue Bradford. I'm a biologist with the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team here. 
I'm Barb Beller, just a private citizen from Duke's Idaho. John Beller, also Idaho. Josh Hemingway, um, I guess normally I'm the wildlife program manager here on Tulsa Valley National Forest Park and Acting Chief. And Council Wyoming Game and Fish, Dr. Hemingway. Anna Raspberry Yellowstone Yukon Conservation Initiative, based in Helena. Likely Atkins, Greater Yellowstone Coalition, and uh, Becca Lyon, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, member of the Grizzly Bear Conflict Team out of Jackson, Wyoming. Amber Cornick, also U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Bear Conflict Specialist out of Alabama, Montana. Jennifer Bordori, Bear Recovery Office. Nice to see the Sierra Club Beast in motion and just know that it is going to get this year, so it's been stuff that we know is going to be done next spring. Thank you. Ben Nagel, President of the Yahoo Wildlife. Brian Wilson, uh, Wildlife Service Point and Street. Josh Nolak, Speedo. Randy Meadows. Knows that she's Murphy, a private citizen from Tulsa, Wyoming. Yeah, yeah. Justin Swallow is a bear biologist with Francis Wyoming. Terry Gunther, bear biologist. Oh, no. Toby Verdrell, Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Marky Verdrell, member of the Betty Team. Jude White, Yellowstone. Jack Bale, please. Bonnie said about the first day, but Jack. Jack Kuzak, Bellow, Mark Fisher, Okay, thank you everybody. And as we heard from a few folks, it's a little bit difficult to hear. So do the best we can to, to speak loudly. Um, so we will get right moving on with the agenda here. First up is David Diamond, who will give us uh, an update on the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. Happy to do that. Uh, James, I do have a couple of slides. Um, I wanted to also recognize that we have a, a remote attendance option, and there are 17 people online. Uh, just, just so that folks know that that's that happening as part of the setup here. We do not currently like make it happen after break or something. Now I'll try to talk loud. Um, Quite a, a list of folks here here introducing themselves. Really great, great to be in person with everyone um, and uh, working together on these topics. Um, I, like I said, I'm the coordinator for the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. Uh, I'm a Forest Service employee. I work on behalf of the federal uh, habitat managers and the state wildlife uh, agencies uh, that are working on uh, grizzly recovery, delisting, and ongoing conservation. That's the mission um, of uh, IGBC. And I work with the uh, executive committee. This is the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee. Um, and I, I'm also supporting the subcommittees. And so just to give a little bit of context for this subcommittee meeting about what's been happening with the executive committee. Um, they had a virtual meeting in March. Uh, and the topic there has been some, some recognition that, that things are different with grizzly bear distribution and that our ecosystem recovery zone focus uh, it's been very important in, in our success and that there's certain topics that may maybe we can work together on and, and, and coordinate in different ways. So the recognition there was that some hybrid work beyond ecosystem subcommittees uh, on topics like information education and outreach that are more broad ranging uh, uh, was, was in order. And so they met again in person. They had their first in-person meeting in, in several years uh, this summer in uh, Idaho. and. The direction to the subcommittees was a, a clear focus on conservation strategies, on continuing the work uh, towards delisting, 
so that was particularly the case for the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee. And out of that conversation, uh, some energy was put into a small group. You're going to be hearing about that on the agenda today in terms of how we've been getting that conservation strategy uh, ready for, for next steps. And then also at the meeting this summer was that focus on these larger uh, topics of science, of, of habitat, of conflict, and of um, information education and outreach. So to then jump ahead to uh, actually just three weeks from now, um, the executives are actually going to be here in Bozeman. Uh, that's where, where their meeting is going to be. And they'll be looking at the five-year plan. Uh, we, our five-year plan is up for uh, to be looked at and also the plan for next year. And out of some of the different uh, sort of hybrid style groups that have been formed, we have an IEO that's made up from all of the, the, the re, uh, recovery zones and uh, building on the 2019 um, FWP summit, uh, the, the proposal is gonna be to again, bring together practitioners um, and you know put, put, our, put our heads together on uh, all things information education outreach. We also are, uh, Working, we have a small group that was started this summer that's looking at um, some different conflict work at those larger scales. Um, and then they also will be deciding where their summer field visit will be. Um, and I guess it's a question for this group if you want to raise your hand. Uh, the executives haven't done a visit to Yellowstone Ecosystem since 2013. Um, uh, so it, it may be timely, and, and I guess it depends on, on where things are. In, in, of your work. They will be here in Bozeman uh, in December, but that's not quite the same as a, as, a, as a field visit. So that's the executives. And then we have um, obviously the, the first of this, this is the first of the cycle, the fall cycle of meetings for our ecosystem subcommittees. And it's interesting, we've got a mix of online and, and in person. Um, and uh, that again, the, the, the direction that the subcommittees are taking from the executives from the summer is especially in Yellowstone and North Northern Continental Divide, uh, a look at the conservation strategies, and then um, also a direction for the Selkirk and Cabinet Yak subcommittee to begin the work of, of conservation strategy. Um, and then for all of them, the question of, and what are your near term, your actions you know, in the near future, uh, uh, particularly related to these uh, ongoing conservation questions. So um, if you you've found your way to the meeting or you found yourself online, you may have you know, looked at our, our new website, and I just always want to uh, emphasize this because it isn't necessarily the most intuitive, but um, if you go to igbconline.org slash news at any time, meetings that are planned out in the future are on the right-hand side under save the date. And so I get the date up as soon as the subcommittee or the committee picks the date. Um, and then uh, I, about two weeks before a meeting, create the blog post that is the you know, uh, what you see there under North Cascades. Um, and so the date of the blog post is on the top. So you see it's two weeks before the meeting. And then if you click that blog post, then you can get access to the agenda and to the, uh, if we're doing virtual, the virtual access. And then after the meeting, the materials for, the, for those groups uh, appear um, on the committee pages. So you go to the under, um, under committees and, 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 and navigate to that. So the website. And then tomorrow we'll be talking about the Yellowstone ecosystem and the five-year plan and sort of the work of this uh, sub subcommittee. Um, Matt's agenda covers sort of all of the different things that have been work in progress. You're getting reports out on work that's been done to date. And so the, the request is to then look forward a little bit. The, the first bullet there is the bullet that has been the Yellowstone ecosystem's goal for, for some time now, uh, successfully transition to management of a delisted population. And I guess the question is, can we break that down um, into some nearer term objectives, some planned actions, whether that's related to uh, you know, some of the science that we're gonna hear about at this meeting or some of the um, habitat work and, and, and reporting. And then I guess another question is, and are there any other goals that you want to articulate uh, for this Yellowstone group? Um, in, in any of these areas. And then finally, the question that I've, I've asked, you know, you will, you'll have time to, in the meeting to think about this and, and come back to it, but are there, as a, as a Yellowstone group, are there any recommendations that you have for the larger IGDC? Uh, so that's that's what I have. Any, any questions? Okay. 
questions. <laughs> Good. Um, We can get Jennifer's presentation up next. Okay. <laughs> okay, have a good clever. Um, but we thought that this would be a good overview because, um, as David said, Yellowstone is working on revisions, the NCDE is working on revisions. And the Selkirk Cavignac is also starting theirs. And as I've been involved with several of them, they've asked me to give this presentation. But please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, we're going to be giving this to all the subcommittees. So everybody will have kind of the same background information. Jennifer, can you, can you tell us all? Yeah, I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I'm a grizzly bear biologist with the Grizzly Bear Recovery Program in Missoula. Um, so we're going to talk about the conservation strategy, what the purpose of it is, the process of developing a strategy, what the contents of the strategy are, and then implementation of the strategy. So the recovery plan that is 1993, a little old, I know, um, has had some amendments to it, but what still is relevant is that it does say that as each population attains recovery, that um, we have these population demographic parameters for judging whether that population reaches recovery. Um, and it also says that each ecosystem will develop a conservation strategy that will ensure that there's adequate regulatory mechanisms post delisting and will serve as that post delisting management plan. The strategy does also say that we intend to delist each population as it reaches recovery, which we have attempted to do in Yellowstone unsuccessfully, but that is part of our recovery plan. So just a quick overview for folks that may not be familiar. Okay, so we're here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, the inner boundaries for each of these are the recovery zone boundaries. Um, we have six ecosystems in the lower 48 states. Um, there is darker outlines around the Northern Continental Divide and the Greater Yellowstone, which are the demographic monitoring areas, and I'll talk about that a little more. But in their 1993 recovery plan, these are the six recovery zones that we identified as necessary for recovery of grizzly bears in the lower 48 states. So part of the purpose of the strategy is the status assessment. Uh, when we go to do a proposed rule for any listed species, we have to look at five factors analysis of if the if a population is recovered. You know, the habitat, population criteria, any threats to the population. But looking into the future, one of the key points is adequate regulatory mechanisms. So after you delist. Are there going to be regulations in place that are going to maintain recovery post delisting? And that is part of this conservation strategy. It is a place that summarizes all of those good works that not only are continuing into the future, but those good works that actually got us to recovery. Um, so, like David says, you ask when you can stop going to the gym, just like that, you don't ever get to stop going to the gym. We need a lot of the recovery actions that got us to recovery to continue post delisting because grizzly bears are a conservation reliant species. And the conservation strategy summarizes those commitments that are in state, tribal, uh, federal management plans that are going to continue to make sure that grizzly bears maintain recovery into the future. So how did we develop this? Um, so really importantly, every time we've developed a conservation strategy, this subcommittee around the table has appointed technical members to a team. And those technical members, uh, usually managers and biologists from every agency, participate in the development of this conservation strategy. Um, once that technical team develops a draft, it comes back to all the agencies um, that folks that sit at this table for review um, to approve the draft. 
Once that draft is approved, it then does go out to public review and comment. Um, we usually have in the past done a summary of public comments and talked about how we're responding to them. So we're very transparent in our process in the conservation strategy and do those do the revisions until the subcommittee or whatever subcommittee is working on it votes to approve it. At that stage, then that subcommittee takes the document to the IGBC. And at that point, the IGBC can provide comments and approves the document. And it's only after that that the IGBC agencies sign the memorandum of understanding to implement the strategy. So it is a very multi-step process, um, but we feel like so far it's worked very well. Um, so I just want to go on a timeline real fast, the GYE and the NCDE. As you can see for the GYE, this is a very long timeline. We started this, we released the first draft of the conservation strategy all the way back in 2000. It was completed and released to concurrent with our first proposed delisting in 2007. Um, then after that was vacated by the court, um, we recognized, this subcommittee recognized that there were some updates that were necessary prior to our next delisting. So a new technical team, some people had retired, um, were convened. And we had another draft of the conservation strategy released for public comment. And it was finalized right before our other delisting, 2017. Um, we did also vacate that when it was vacated by the court. Um, but importantly, um, as many of you know, we identified in that 2016 strategy that we needed to do some work on the develop site chapter three that we didn't have time for. So right after we finalized it, um, we convened a technical team that was specific to the habitat standards. Those have been worked over over the last four years and you guys approved that in the spring meeting. So that's done, which is great. And also the spring meeting started talking about chapter two revisions. So that's ongoing. Um, so these are not stagnant documents. We, we are meant to change them and update them as the need arises. The NCD is a little shorter. Um, they have had fewer iterations, um, but they also started a long time ago. Um, they got put on hold a few times because of GYE kind of took the center stage um, as far as delisting goes. But we did complete a conservation strategy in the NCDE in 2018. Um, they have done something a little different. They have done new versions with minor, minor technical changes and clarifications as they have arisen. And so they always keep a document, the most recent version on the webpage, and they also keep a document tracking those changes. Because we all recognize no matter how much work we put into this, there's going to be small errors, small clarifications that need to be made. Um, however, at the spring meeting, we did have direction to reconvene a technical team um, to assess other potential revisions to the strategy that may be a little bigger than those technical edits. Similar to your chapter two, what's going on here. So we're going to be working on that in the NCD also. Um, so I'm going to jump into the contents now, the conservation strategy. Um, so we have the executive summary, pretty straightforward. The MOU is what really counts because that is the commitment by each agency when they sign that document that they are going to implement what's in it. The introduction of background. Um, the important part here is that the conservation strategies in general, like I said, is you know, we got to recovery by doing these successful things, such as having secure habitat standards and mortality limits. And so the introduction of background really explains how we reached recovery and how we're going to continue that effort moving forward. Uh, chapter two is the demographic chapter about population monitoring. Chapter three is about habitat objectives and monitoring. Then we do have conflict prevention and management and information and education, because we all recognize that those efforts have been crucial to reducing and cause mortality and reach recovery and need to be continued into the future. Um, we have directions on implementation and evaluation, and then we have the existing laws regulations. So, you know, what is all the background that's feeding into this? Um, and then finally, appendices that can be technical documents describing the actual monitoring details that are maybe a little too bulky to put in the document. 
Um, so a lot of this I'm not going to go into in detail. I'm going to really focus focus on like the population and habitat chapters because um, those are the things that are kind of the meat of it. Um, so like I said, this outlines the legal authorities and policies that are continuing post management. Um, it reviews the current status. In, most importantly, commits to concluding the best available science and updating it with that. It also has a vision statement, and they are slightly different between the ecosystems. So for the Yellowstone, you're really focusing on the primary conservation area. So for anybody in the room who doesn't know, the primary conservation area is the same boundary as the recovery zone. Uh, it's just the reflex uh, shift from managing for recovery to managing for a recovered population so to say. So the goal is that you have a core population for which you're managing or maintaining that core in the foreseeable future and for that to be a source population and continue to expand it. Um, so just zooming in a little more on the GYE, we have the recovery zone boundary. Um, we have the Green area is what we call suitable habitat. And so that was developed um, in concurrence with the study team. Um, and that's areas that we expect bears to occur um, biologically and socially acceptable. But if you notice, the demographic monitoring area also includes some valleys. And that's because those could be mortality states that are completely surrounded by suitable habitat. So um, when the first conservation strategy in the GYE was developed, it focused solely on the recovery zone. And then the IGBC actually gave direction to yes, to expand it and said, no, it needs to focus and cover and encompass the whole population of Yellowstone. And that's when this was a suitable habitat and the DMA was identified. So the DMA, the demographic monitoring area, is the area in which the population is counted and in which mortality limits apply. Frank will go into that more today in our presentation. <laughs> um, then this big boundary just reflects what we proposed as a distinct population segment in both 2007 and in 2017, the area in which we thought um, kind of combined the Yellowstone population. So it does also go on then because of that direction to identify that, you know, it is a goal to allow bearers to live outside the PCA, where it's socially acceptable, biologically suitable habitat, um, and to maintain, but to also maintain existing recreation and management opportunities in those areas. Um, again, I already covered the DMA, so that is where the population is counted and the recovery criteria apply, but also the criteria within the conservation is strategy applied to the demographic monitoring area. Um, we do expand on the public information and education efforts as the population expands to reduce those conflicts, provide responsive management to address grizzly bear conflicts, and to manage grizzly bears as a game animal, um, including allowing hunting where and when appropriate. So the NCD is slightly different. Um, they are similar in that they're doing a, they have a PCA. Um, they really identify that they have an important role in their demographics and their genetics because they are the conduit with Canada and they are a potential genetic source for the population. Um, so they have, they're slightly different, but still re recognizing the importance of the recovery zone as the core of the ecosystem. Um, they manage in slightly different zones. Um, they have a zonal approach. So again, the recovery zone becomes the primary conservation area, and that has the most protective measures similar to Yellowstone. Um, but you can also see they have this a buffer that's zone one, and then they have some demographic connectivity areas. They have zone two and zone three, and there's different goals for each one of these zones. Uh, most importantly, conservation strategy has this as a dashed line um, because they recognize that we had not act, the service had not actually defined the DPS boundary before this conservation strategy was put out. And so recognize that these lines may change. Um, so zones one and two, um, 
So bears are allowed to expand or and expected to expand in zone one and two, but um, you have still the core of the ecosystem and you have the GCAs, which are more protective. And zone three was specifically identified as not only being primarily uh, private lands, but providing no habitat linkage to other ecosystems. Um, so the need for habitat management um, was not as important out there, for example, because bears are not being connected to other ecosystems. But the focus is going to be on conflict response and management for conflict reduction. So in chapter two, we have these demographic objectives specific to the DMA. The GYE is currently to maintain a population around the 2002 and 2014 estimate as written in the 2016 strategy. For the NCDE, um, they are to manage for a population with a probability of at least 90% of being above 800 individuals. So similar in managing to about the population that was there when recovery was achieved, different ways of going about it. Um, they also still have the distribution of females with young. Uh, that is one of the current recovery criteria to make sure that you have reproduction occurring throughout the ecosystem um, and not just concentrated in one part of the ecosystem. And then a mortality threshold to make sure you're maintaining a recovering population. Um, so in addition, there are some other objectives at heart in the recovery criteria that are in the conservation strategy. You'll recognize that a population trend is also important as a number doesn't tell you the whole story at one point in time. Um, also, genetic management of isolated populations. So both the NCDE and what we're working on currently in the GYE speak towards the importance of genetic management, um, particularly for the GYE and being isolated. Um, estimated distribution, the commitment to, to, add, to continue as current as each population calculates that every two years. And then monitoring reports. So all the agencies that are actually monitoring bring those reports back to this group and each subcommittee every year um, to for you to evaluate and see if anything is not as it should be and if anything should be changed. So those monitoring reports are an important feedback mechanism on the strategy. Um, so moving to chapter three, we have the habitat objectives. In the primary conservation area, or the recovery zone is really focused on three things. Secure habitat, which are areas that are buffered from motorized routes. Definitions do differ slightly between the ecosystems. Develop sites and livestock allotment. So although we measure them and have slight differences between the ecosystems, and there are allowances and exceptions for each, in each strategy, those are the three key things to reduce human force, cause mortality, and displacement related to habitat in all the recovery zones. Um, these are also monitored and measured or reported um, usually biannually for some of these. Uh, but again, that feedback mechanism to make sure that we're meeting uh, what we committed to. Um, and they're by bear management subunit. I'm not gonna show you that map, but they're divided into a smaller unit to represent female home annual home ranges. Um, so we do have some differences Inside the Yellowstone area, you have a lot, sorry, outside the recovery zone. Yellowstone is largely still public land. You have a ton of wilderness, uh, inventory roadless areas, proposed wilderness. And so we don't have any additional commitments to habitat protection in the DMA outside the recovery zone, inside Yellowstone, because you already have a vastly protected area. Um, which is great. We don't have to worry about that. Um, that's a little bit different in NCDE. As you can see with this map, this white is private land. They have a lot of private land in their demographic monitoring area. And they have the big cities. They have Kalispell. Um, they have Folsom. Um, so that kind of changes how they have decided to manage outside of the NCDE's GCA, but inside the recovery zone. So they have still made a commitment to have some linear motorized route density um, to help maintain and continue occupancy um, because those protections are already in place by wilderness areas. 
they have them in place on the fourth in the fourth plan. Um, DNRC has them in place for their plans. The tribes have them in place for their plans. So um, they need those extra protections in management plans because they're not already in existence for other mechanisms. They also specifically have demographic connectivity areas. Those areas are specifically to facilitate females to live in those areas, albeit at lower densities than the core, but for females to get to the Kavanyak ecosystem with such a small population, and also to serve as a source population for the Bidiru, where we don't currently have a population. So they identified those two areas as corridors that they would manage specifically for habitat movement uh, and residency in those areas. Zone two um, is a corridor potentially for Yellowstone, but we just we only need genetic connectivity to Yellowstone. We don't need demographic connectivity. And what is already in place um, for the Forest Service management plans, as shown by the male expansion and movement, is compatible with males moving into that area. So there are not grizzly bear specific management in that area, but you know, there's elk management and all kinds of other wildlife management and wilderness that's serving that purpose in zone two to allow grizzly bears to get from the NCDE moving toward the GYE for that genetic connectivity. Again, zone three, no habitat protection is necessary because it does not provide linkage to any other area and it's primarily private land. Um, so we also, again, have additional habitat objectives and monitoring. One last thing, I guess, about the previous ones, we don't have, re we did not have recovery criteria for habitat objectives in our 1993 recovery plan. However, we did get sued over that. So we have a 1997 settlement agreement that says we have to develop habitat recovery criteria for each ecosystem prior to delisting. So for Yellowstone, we finalized those in 2007. For the NCDE, we finalized those in 2018. So we were developing those concurrent with the strategy, you know, all at the same time and finished them at the same time. But they have yet to be identified or uh, developed for the other ecosystems yet. So there's some other things that we identify that are slightly different, again, to be ecosystem specific. Um, in the GYE, we monitor the four high core food items. And we also have some language in the strategy about facilitating connectivity by working with transportation planning and food storage orders to reduce conflict. In the NCDE, um, because they don't have uh, specific foods they monitor, they are monitoring body condition and stable isotopes isotopes as a surrogate for body condition and habitat quality. And they also have those food storage orders to reduce conflict. Uh, so that's the habitat chapters. Um, really quickly, this conflict reduction and management is really important. This is Yellowstone, um, my fair jam. Um, it just recognizes that the sanitation, IE and O efforts that are currently happening are really important to continue happening because human caused mortality is the primary source of mortality for grizzly bears. So we need to continue doing these good things. Um, and this really incorporates what all those individual states and tribes and federal plans already are in place. Um, that everything they're already doing, this is a place to say, these are all the good things we're doing um, and it's the synopsis of it. And we are gonna continue doing that. Um, and as you guys will see, with the, you know, you get the annual conflict reports to the subcommittee. They include them in the annual vegetative report too. Um, most important maybe is implementation. We get a lot of questions like, this is a post delisting monitoring plan. Why do we need this now? Why do we need to update it now? Well, it gets kind of complicated. So even though it's a post delisting monitoring plan, the Forest Service has already incorporated all of these habitat standards in the forest plans. So they're operating under those forest plans that's in here, these habitat now. So if they're, if we were to change this now, as we just did, then the Forest Service has to figure out how to incorporate it. And so even though this is a post delisting monitoring plan, some of this is already being incorporated. That's true of the NCDE also into current action management plans. So it is a relevant document. Um, post delisting, you get this turns into, yes, turns into a coordinating committee. So 
name changes slightly. A lot of the same function. You're going to receive monitoring for, you guys have done it twice, you know, same monitoring for, same presentations. Um, and then the agents would agree in to continue implementing. Um, so for the most part, like I said, it doesn't change what everybody's doing on the ground. Um, the one thing that could potentially change is that hunting element and ma management removals, um, you know, commitments about conflict, management removals, but the state's no longer under the 1986 guideline for management removals. But those commitments to, you know, manage to those mortalities are still there. Um, as we already said, detail lists existing laws, regulations, claims, and commitments. This is where we kind of also have that catch-22. So some of the, sometimes, like the forest plans, we developed the habitat first, and then the forest implemented them. Some of the other things are we summarize regulations that are already in place, like the arm, Montana's arm. You know? And so we, we probably do need to look at potentially updates, because Montana has some new regulations on the books that are not currently reflected in the conservation strategy. So which comes first happens both ways sometimes. Um, but this subcommittee is a good place, I, I believe, for your feedback about um, what is a, what is working. The evaluation is also important. So the strategy commits to revision to the strategy to make sure that you're still using the best available science. Um, so specifically, both commit to a review every five years after it goes into place and that you'll take a fresh look. Doesn't mean you have to revise it, but that you'll take a look at it and see if there's anything that needs to be changed. Revisions are also subject to public review and comment committed in the strategy. It also talks about thresholds. So if things are not being met, so say for example, you get your monitoring report and you know you exceeded your you know secure you reduced your secure core habitat. You're like, oh no, what happened there? Um, there's a there's some thresholds in there saying, okay, the study team in this instance or the science team for the other um, subcommittees will do a bio biology monitoring review. That's our opportunity to look and see has something changed with the biology of the species? Do we need to update how we're evaluating it? Or um, is there something happening in the ecosystem that we don't know about? You know, do we need to change um, you know, our food storage or any manner of things? But it's their opportunity for them to bring it back to the subcommittee and make potential suggestions to changes to make sure that we're still maintaining a recovered population. And then one next step would be this fish and wildlife sort of status review. So it gives the opportunity for if something is looking kind of wonky, for there to be a review by the study team, a review by the subcommittee, and an opportunity to try to fix it before something were to get worse, in which case the service would do a status review. Um, an example of that was last year, last time we said if mortality thresholds were exceeded for any age of sex class for three consecutive years, we would do a status review. Um, any significant changes in management plan or that we're committed to, we would do a status review. Um, so we're trying to tier this to give uh, adaptive management to be implemented implemented in each of the years. So the, just a few further considerations as we wrap up. Um, we currently ensure that, the, again, this adequate regulatory mechanism will continue post delisting. That's the main purpose of the strategy. Um, potential needs for revisions. As I said, we have new state regulations. Uh, I think we all rare court decision has really infected the subcommittees, um, discussions and changes, and just new information in general. You know, we try to keep up on the best available science, new research comes out, um, and we want to make sure that we're doing our, the best job we can do. So I really want to thank all the way back in decades of time, you know, the NC, all the NCD and GYE technical team members who have worked on the numerous iterations of the conservation strategies in both ecosystems. There's a lot of meetings that go into this, um, a lot of work time. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it's, I think it's rewarding if we get there. Um, also thank, you know, Hillary, David, and Cecily helped with the presentation. 
Um, so I thank you for that. And with that, is there any questions? Thank you, Jennifer. That was outstanding. It really provides a really good foundation for everything else that we're talking about today and tomorrow. That was really, really good. Frank? I do have one question. Sometimes there's confusion about who the author of the oh. conservation <laughs> strategy is. Maybe clarify that. Yeah, so I think that has been confusing because originally our office did take the pen, but we do not see ourselves as an ownership agency. This is a subcommittee document. Um, so, but that has created that confusion, and particularly when we have also a few times put it out for public comment. It doesn't matter which agency put it set out for public comment. The Forest Service did it last time. Um, but I think moving forward, David Diamond has agreed, at least for the NCDE, to be the keeper of the pen as a non-partisan member of to keep this. So um, we'll see what he will do here. But I think that is helpful. It is, we see it and we cite it as a subcommittee product, not owned by any one agency. Okay. Okay, thanks. So we will now move on to uh, agency and member updates. Uh, we'll start with the Fish and Wildlife Service with Hillary Cooley. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Uh, I have three pretty brief updates for the subcommittee. First on petitions. So uh, most of you are, I'm sure, aware we have three petitions um, from Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming asking us to delist. Um, Wyoming is asking us to delist GYE. Montana has asked us to delist the NCDE, and Idaho has asked us to look at the lower 48 states. And I, I, sorry, we don't have a lot of updates. We're working on those petitions. Um, number two, the North Cascades ecosystem, which is one of our five, six recovery zones uh, that currently has no population in it. Uh, probably a lot of you heard the news last week too, but in case you didn't, um, last Thursday we announced jointly with North Cascades National Park um, that we are reinitiating an environmental impact statement to evaluate restoration alternatives. Um, this, we had been in an environmental, been in the middle of an environmental impact statement process, probably for five years we were working on it, do the same thing, looking at restoration alternatives. That was terminated by Department of Interior two years ago. And so um, we, we stopped work on it. And so we're restarting that process. We'll be looking at a range of alternatives from do nothing, let bears walk in on their own, um, to actually facilitating reintroduction at different rates. Um, we're also going to be at the same time looking at um, one of the options will include a 10J experimental population. And that would be um, a regulation that would allow us to provide a little more management flexibility for management of the bears, also of the habitat. So um, we're starting out with a 30 day public comment period. Um, so that will end December 14th is, the, is when it closes. We're gonna have four different um, virtual scoping meetings. The first one already happened, it was just Tuesday. Uh, we have another one this Friday night at 8 p.m. So, my Friday night. <laughs> and then we have a couple more, uh, I think it's the week after Thanksgiving. Um, yeah, so we're hoping that the public will, will tune into those and provide some comment for us. The third update, I think the subcommittee is aware we had been, the Fish and Wildlife Service had been working on hiring some conflict staff. Um, it was a long process, but we finally onboarded our five conflict staff just this summer. And so they, they came in in the middle of conflict season. Um, a little difficult timing, but it's great to have them on board. We have five people. We have a conflict coordinator, Ben Menes. He'll, he is in Missoula. Um, we have uh, one person, Becca Lyon. She's in Jackson. She, she can be working on this ecosystem primarily. And then we have a couple people in the NCDE, um, Kalispell, Helena, and we have a rover 
who is in Missoula and can go where we need that person to go. And so as I, you know, this was a, just start figuring things out this, this year, trying to assist with conflicts. Um, a lot of time, Phil was spent on education, doing um, fair fairs and, you know, whatever other uh, education opportunities there were, we tried to take advantage of it. Did a lot of conflict prevention projects. And you know, so in the future, we're we'll gonna continue to spend a lot of time on those things. I wanted to um, mention, especially to Danielle, you know, we wanna, education will be a big part of what we're all doing. And so we wanna make sure we're consistent with IGBC and this subcommittee. And so I know IEO, are always short staffed. And so we would like to work with you, Becca's behind you. Okay, good. Yeah, we just want to help. We've got a little extra capacity and we want to be helpful. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, Rick King from Wyoming. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So uh, just a brief update. I'll, I'll start with, of course, the Game and Fish Department has a considerable investment in, in grizzly bear management in the state. We have a our large carnivore section managed by Dan Thompson that, that worked really hard to keep that critter on the landscape. Uh, just for the uh, last fiscal year, our, our expenditures were you know about $1.7 million uh, in direct expenses and well over $2 million, including some other um, overhead expenses. We continue to see expansion of, of grizzly bears well beyond the DMA. We, uh, Jennifer talked about the, the DMA. We, we have seen bears expand well beyond that uh, and continue to see uh, see that each year. We, uh, of course, as, as bears have expanded beyond the DMA and even within the DMA, we, we put a lot of effort into managing conflict. We've had a couple of interesting uh, studies that have been ongoing over the last couple of years looking at uh, the ability for livestock producers to detect losses from grizzly bears. Uh, we, we initiated a, a project this year in the Upper Green to look at uh, yearling cattle losses and and see how well our producers are able to detect those those losses. So that that's some ongoing work. It's uh, been very interesting. A lot of a huge workload to get that done, but it, it's important for us. The state of Wyoming has a pretty extensive damage compensation program for livestock producers. So that's really important, important component for us to maintain support for this critter on the landscape. And so those research efforts help us fine tune that um, that damage compensation program. Uh, we we did have, of course, a, a number of high profile human interaction situations this year. Those, of course, garnered a lot of even national attention, but overall, our, our conflict workload or, or the number of conflicts for the year was, was uh, I don't know that you would say it wasn't above average, but we did have some very high profile conflicts. We continued to uh, continued our efforts on our standard monitoring work across the state. We were able to get into some places this year, like uh, Sunlight and Crandall. We, we captured, uh, let's see, nine grizzly bears in Sunlight Crandall, uh, despite the major flooding that was occurring up there. We got into Moccasin Basin and had six captures there. We conducted our observation flights and, uh, and our crew, despite all their heavy field workload, spent a bunch of time, especially in September, getting data prepped and ready for the demographic workshop, which we'll talk more about. Lastly, I'll just touch on some of our bearwise work. Of course, the bearwise component of our management program has been, been an important aspect of our work for a long time. Um, we've been able to continue those efforts in uh, bearwise Jackson Hole. It's part of a multi-agency effort. We Work with Teton County to develop and support uh, land development regulations for bear resistant garbage infrastructure to reduce potential conflicts there. Um, we've continued our bearwise community efforts in Wapiti and the Hootsaroka Front, Pinedale and Dubois. We uh, 
developed um, a how-to video for installment of electric fencing to, to, uh, to help reduce bear conflicts. We participated in a number of living and large carnivore workshops across the, the state and across the, uh, the country in terms of participating in some uh, efforts with, with other entities and agencies. And, and lastly, I just mentioned with um, the help from SCI and the American Bear Foundation, we were able to conduct a bear spray giveaway at Cody Lander Jackson and find them. Those have been extremely popular events and a, and a good way to get effective deterrent in people's hands as, as they live and recreate in the uh, grizzly bear country. So Hillary mentioned that we are still waiting on information back from Governor Gordon's petition that, that he submitted back in January. And uh, I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Rick. And McDonald from Montana. Up there. So thanks again. I'm Ken McDonald with the uh, Montana Fish, Life, and Parks. Um, Jennifer did a good job of sort of teeing up some of my stuff, so hopefully it connects well. Um, so probably our most uh, timely report is um, several of you got a note saying we're about to release a grizzly bear, a statewide grizzly bear management plan. So we've been working on that. The, the, the hope is to have that out uh, for public comment on December 1st. Um, that's actually going to be two documents. There's the proposed plan and then a EIS analyzing the impacts of the proposed plan. Um, so, so we've been working on that. Uh, Rich Harris, who was on our staff, was the primary author. Um, and just a little bit about what to expect. The, the plan really doesn't do anything um, substantially new. It pretty much the, the one of the main things this plan does, it just consolidates a bunch of different documents. We have two state plans, one for Southwest Montana, one for Western Montana. And then we have the two conservation strategies that, that Jennifer talked about. So it kind of lumps all that into a single document. It, it affirms that the commitments um, in those conservation strategies um, that are relevant to our agency, um, particularly the demographic parameters, um, and, and just sort of tries to, tries to identify all the different pieces and parts and lumps them together. Um, a couple other things um, that are new. Um, one is that that this plan um, identifies connectivity between those recovery zones as an objective for our management. Um, those areas, we have a lot of real, real detailed prescriptive stuff for the individual recovery areas. And we have all this ground in between that everybody goes, well, what are we doing there? So this this makes it clear um, if it goes through as proposed that, that those will be in areas that provide connectivity between recovery zones. Um, connectivity will be a priority. And then converse to that, if it's an area that's really doesn't provide connectivity, um, and a good example was zone three there in the MTBE that Jennifer talked about, those would not be a priority um, and we would probably um, be less tolerant and more aggressive towards responding to conflicts in those areas. Um, plan uh, doesn't differentiate between listed and not listed. It kind of anticipates uh, some some areas could be delisted, some areas listed, and sort of has this hybrid, so it continues to recognize the authority of the Endangered Species Act and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and the roles and responsibilities. So, um, yeah, so that's that's that. That'll be coming out again. Again, the, the intention is around December 1st. Ken, the yeah. question, and, and you probably just said this and I missed it, but when you talk about the, those zones and where you would manage for connectivity and where you wouldn't as much, those are mapped. No. So, so Mary's asking if those zones are mapped. The, the NCD has a zone three. Right. Um, that is the east front, basically. Uh, but but kind of what we're saying is where we anticipate connectivity 
to happen. And, and I know like Cecily's done some work and they're doing some, some additional work to modeling where, where the likely places are. Uh, so that, but the, so the locations might, might work over time based on the information. Yeah. Um, a couple other things. So, so I just said we're we're talking about connectivity. We've been trying to staff up. You know, we we've kind of had people in key areas in these recovery zones, and as the bears have expanded, a lot of our conflicts are in these in between areas. So, over the past few years, we've been able to staff up. We got a position a couple years ago in the uh, Anaconda Deer Lodge area that kind of covers that area between. Yellowstone and NCDE. We had a position in Red Lodge that's dealing with some of that uh, conflict that's heading east, this ecosystem. And then this past year, we we got a new position uh, that's going to be based in the Bitterroot, kind of focused on, you know, we're we're anticipating bears. We're seeing bears starting to come to the Bitterroot, so trying to actually get ahead of the bears for once instead of chasing them. Um, so so. Uh, we hired a guy named Bruce Montgomery, so we based out of Missoula, fo focused on the Bitterroot. And then uh, we had Rory Trimbo working in that Butte Anaconda area, but Hillary stole him. So, <laughs> so we just uh, hired uh, a guy named Brad Bayless um, for that area. He's going to be, uh, he's a, a former game warden, really good guy, so he'll be working in that connectivity area that you know, goes all the way down to the big hole and up to Helena and beyond. So trying to get ahead of the bears and, and help with that connectivity, because we all know that the biggest the biggest thing that either generates support or antagonism for bears is how how we deal with conflicts when they happen. So we're trying to get ahead of that. Um, Jennifer mentioned differences, some some new state laws, and I think I've talked about this before, but just. Get everybody up to speed. We had a, a law passed last legislative session in 2021 that uh, basically said if there's a conflict there outside of a recovery zone, fish, wildlife, and parks can't move it. So um, that leaves Hillary and her folks then to move it. So we worked with with the Fish and Wildlife Service on, a, on an MOU between the agencies, kind of outlining roles and responsibilities. Um, and that's part of the, the role of the, the folks that are here today to introduce themselves as a conflict team. When we have a conflict there outside of recovery zone, we'll still go and go respond to the conflict. But if the, the decision is to move it um, outside the recovery zone, then the Fish and Wildlife Service gets to move it. The other part of that law says that, that, that we can only move bears to uh, sites that are approved by the Fish and Wildlife Commission. So last year we worked, our, our bear people worked with the land management agencies. We identified a big list of, of sites. Most of them have been used or uh, have a history of being used. And, and the, the one caveat, it has to be an occupied habitat. So we took that to our commission. They approved that list of sites for a five year period. So, so if we have a bear to move, um, we can only move it to one of those approved sites. Um, I think I don't think it really changed much. Um, the, the focus is still our bear people are working with the land management agencies before we move a bear to make sure everybody's good with that site or this site. Um, but it is it is one more piece that we got to be aware of. Um, another thing is uh, Jennifer alluded to. The uh, ARM rules, so ARM stands for Administrative Rules of Montana. It's a formal rulemaking process. Um, a few years ago, we incorporated the demographic criteria of the NCDE conservation strategy into administrative rule. So it's not just an agreement that, that the agency signed, but it's actually in our rules. Um, we, we amended that rule slightly this year to, to clarify that that any mortalities are the result of hunting um, count against those mortality thresholds. Just to make it real clear that, that if we did ever go to hunting, it counts against those thresholds. 
And then we also have in there that any bears that are moved out of the ecosystem, so we move bears of a cavity act, for example, that counts against those mortality thresholds too, because it's a loss of that population. So that that the intent of that is to give it some more uh, regulatory authority. And and then our hope is to do the same for the Yellowstone. So incorporate those demographic criteria in the Yellowstone conservation strategy into an administrative rule. And uh, we were set to go on that, but then we realized we we're going to be changing those criteria. So or potentially changing. That's what they're looking at now. So as soon as that's finalized, we'll put those into to administrative rule as well. Um, Hillary mentioned petitions. So we put together a petition, uh, the D-list, the NCDE. Governor's anxiously awaiting a response. All I can tell you, he keeps wondering what part of 90 days <laughs> don't you get? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, um, one more timely thing is uh, we uh, are starting our, or we do, we have our wolf hunting and trapping seasons. There's concern about um, last year snares were added to trapping. So, so the commission included in the wolf regulations that uh, the trapping, the start date for trapping and snaring in occupied grizzly bear habitat be a floating date. Sometime the earliest it could be is the Monday after Thanksgiving. The latest the start date would be is December 31st. And, and then gave us the gave the agency the authority to determine when that would be and in which areas based on bear activity. So Monday after Thanksgiving is just a couple of weeks away. So we have a process in place with all of our bear specialists that they're keeping track of, uh, you know, grizzly bear activity based on radio telemetry, based on sightings, also black bear activity, kind of the surrogate, how the weather's looking, all of the different activities. And once a week, we'll, we'll make a decision on, is it, can we open the wolf trappings in a certain area with a, you know, a high probability of not having any incidental take to grizzly bears? We did that last season, it, it worked pretty well. We got heavily criticized by some of the trappers and the trapper advocates, but we didn't catch any grizzly bears. So that's the intent is don't jeopardize wolf season with take the grizzly bears. There was a, a um, junction issue yesterday on part of our wolf season. We're still figuring out one of the things in that injunction was uh, prohibit snaring, the temporary injunction. The hearing on that is, I think it's the same day trapping was supposed to start to 28. So we'll know then whether that gets lifted or that carries forward. That's all I got, Mr. Chairman. Oh, plus okay. everything Rick said, lots of busy bear activity. Really. <laughs> Spent a lot of money, all that stuff. Appreciate it, Ken. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, for Idaho, Toby Boudreaux, our wildlife program coordinator, is going to give the update. Good afternoon. Uh, anyways, uh, I guess our Idaho's report is fairly short. Um, we've spent a lot of time, a lot of staff time working on updates to the conservation strategy, not just chapter two, but primarily chapter two, but updating it all from the last time we tried to make this thing go. Um, and uh, I did want to say I appreciate all the work from our sister uh, partner agencies that have helped. Uh, with that work and getting it through, and hopefully sometime in the not so distant future, we will have a final version of the updated conservation strategy. Um, and the other thing I had to say was just sort of reiterating what Ken and, and Rick said that, uh, except with Idaho's petition, there's still 114 days of shopping left to get us an answer in 12 months. So anyways, uh, other than that, uh, we look, we look forward with bated breath to the answer to it and, uh, and how to move forward. Because that's really the most important thing is, uh, delisting recovered grizzly bear populations. Because that's what is supposed to happen. So look forward to that and, uh, that's it. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Toby. 
Okay, any updates from anyone else uh, from the forest, from the park? We can just uh, go around the table. Would you like to? I guess first? Yellowstone can go first. Uh, Yellowstone National Park. Um, I'm going to knock on wood. It was a quiet year for bears inside the park. Uh, you may have heard that we had a little flood uh, in the park that limited access to the Northern Range. Um, so it's closed for public access for about four months. Was that contributed? Probably did. Um, but uh, we had all natural mortalities inside the park. We did have five intraspecific mortalities, which was quite interesting for us, although not unprecedented. Um, and then I, I wanted to give a shout out to both uh, Montana Fish and Wildlife Parks and the Fish and Wildlife Service for helping with some bears that we had in our gateway community of Gardner. Um, it's not inside the park, but it's adjacent to the park. We have a lot of uh, staff that live in Gardner and a lot of obviously community members that are faced with the park there. And uh, your staff really helped out with um, uh, sound two cubs. And we also had a, a big male bear that was one. So thank you to both of your agencies for helping uh, get that uh, result. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I had a little flood too. That's, yeah, but yeah, but not related to bears. I, I the only thing I was thinking might be relevant to this group is we are in the early stage of working a new complaint, um, where where a lot of the fundamental aspects of the complaint are around. Well, if it was on a decision on term grazing permits, we had evaluated six allotments, three of which had been vacant, held three vacant, uh, but reissued term grazing permits on the other three allotments and then have a complaint uh, that we're working through the scheduling and aspects of right now. Well, I was saying it, it's the East Paradise uh, allotments in the Paradise Valley. Yeah, yeah from Grand Teton, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a great year for being able to see uh, for visitors from around the country to be able to see uh, Grizzlies in their natural habitat with a really minimal bear human contact. So, which was nice to have. I think uh, a shout out to Wyoming Game and Fish, to the state, Teton County, town of Jackson, for the, the Bear Wise Jackson whole initiative that's going on in terms of really trying to engage the community stewardship. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation has uh, can, uh, provided funding to that. Uh, program, but we really appreciate the leadership from Wyoming Game and Fish in terms of managing and leading that. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Matt, if it's okay with, for you, with you, um, I'd like to say the update from the Beaverhead Deer Lodge is part of my uh, presentation at four. Good to me. Al, do you have a thing? No, not this afternoon, no updates. Great. Mary? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a major in, in Park County, other than we were the home of one of the high conflict uh, bears of bear encounters. Um, two young wrestlers from Powell, they made it out in as good shape as they could. I will give a shout out to the game of fish there and our search and rescue crew for making that happen. And I will echo what Rick said. I mean, many of you might know I'm also an outfitter in the backcountry, Fraser Teton National Forest, Shoshone National Forest. It was a quiet year. Um, I attribute a lot of that to a very mild fall, but uh, we didn't see we didn't see a lot of a lot of things shaking back there as far as bears or bear conflict in the backcountry. It was a good year. Thank you. Anyone else down here? Okay, that concludes our agency member updates. Um, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and move forward and do the information, education, and outreach updates. Are you ready to do that, Danielle? Okay, thank you. I don't have one packet for everybody, but maybe a couple. Thank you. 
Right. So as I said before, I'm Danielle. I work for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and I'm going to be speaking about the information education and outreach subcommittee for the Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, knowledge and information are the antidote to fear. So I want to thank all of my colleagues here today for sharing their information, helping increase our understanding and awareness of bears. Uh, we take our role really seriously in communicating about bears to the public. So I want to give you an overview a little bit about what the IE and OSA committee does, and then all of like the work that we're doing this year specifically. So first off, um, information education and outreach subcommittee um, exists in every ecosystem, but then there's also an executive, you know, committee. So I just want to help understand the structure here. David explained this earlier, but repetition is always good. So, so we're the Yellowstone Ecosystem IE and OSA subcommittee. And that'll play into something we'll talk about our funding here in a minute. And our job is to coordinate information, education, and outreach among IGBC member agencies in support of grizzly bear recovery and conservation. Our responsibilities include coordination and development and dissemination of consistent messages about grizzly bear ecology and behavior, how to live, work, and recreate in grizzly bear habitat, how to secure attractants, how to use bear spray, how to avoid conflicts. And we'll talk about that. You will see in front of you on there's a messaging document. This is the IGBC's official bear safety messages. So this is all kind of tied together. We also coordinate and oversee the uh, annual IGBC IENO funding program. I know it's alphabet soup up here, but bear with me. <laughs> so then the other thing I don't I don't directly work with this, but David works with uh, another person to work on our website. So our website's another part of the IENO realm, and then. We also promote effective actions and techniques to increase human safety and decrease the likelihood of human bear conflict. So that's just a little bit about what we're about. Um, and who are our members for the Yellowstone Ecosystem Subcommittee? Uh, Kylie, uh, Kylie Kendall, Morgan Jacobson, Lori Wolf, and myself from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Kyle Garrett from Wyoming, Denise German and Morgan Morphin from the National Park Service, and Kim Johnston from People and Carnivores. So that's our subcommittee. Um, and then I also just want to put a, a shout out to anyone. If you if you have a person in your agency that you think would be a good fit for our group, please send them my way. I'm always looking for new people um, to be a part of this process. Okay, so on to the funding request. So every year, uh, IGBC has a pot of money we award to to strong proposals for the increase of um, effective actions and techniques in human safety and decreasing grizzly bear conflict. So we use the mission statement like David and, and Jennifer talked about earlier as our guide, and we look to fund projects that support that mission statement. So for future years, what do you need to do to apply for an IGBC um, funding? You can first you have to be qualified nonprofit, organization, association, state, federal, or tribal entity focused on grizzly bear conservation, or at least this project be focused on grizzly bear conservation. Uh, you want to be consistent with the uh, mission statement of IGBC and the roles and responsibilities. Um, and then be at least in one of the grizzly bear ecosystems, that's important. And then the, the request should be at least $2,500. So this year we had 40, we have an anticipated $42,000 to award to projects in all six of our ecosystems. So I want to just like paint the picture of the amount of money we're working with and how many projects we might be trying to award. So this year, um, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, we've received uh, six proposals that are specific to the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem and two more that are kind of multi-ecosystem. We, we also allow people to uh, apply for like something that will affect everybody um, or be able to be used in every ecosystem. So this year it included bear spray giveaways. I'm just generally like giving you a sense of what the proposals are. And we haven't chosen who they are, who's going to get them yet. So I want to give you an idea of what people thought of for this year. So 
um, bear spray giveaways, public service announcements, bear resistant garbage cans, panniers, backpacking canisters, um, making safety information accessible in other languages, e education events, apple picking events, community bear stewardship projects, and carcass removal programs. Really impressive. Every year I'm always amazed at the creativity of the folks that are applying for these. So just the Yellowstone ecosystem, um, that request, to those requests totaled, um, let's see here, about $36,000. And then there's the others in the other ecosystems, that's another 16,000. So if we just awarded only to Yellowstone, that would take up most, most if not all the money. So I just want to, again, paint that picture. Um, and then interestingly, so for all of the ecosystems combined, we received 20 proposals, which totaled $120,900. So that's for all six ecosystems. Um, do you guys have any questions so far about any of this or uh, anything related to the IDNO proposal? Well, Danielle, I guess I'm just curious on when we talk about this under IGBC, we we actually have other partners who match what uh, what we put up. Uh, the question is about matching. I'm I don't know if you mean for the pot of money that IGBC has. Do you know, David? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. My understanding is it comes from member agency. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's it, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It just seems like it since there's so much interest in a lot of that it would be something that we would look to match. I will say that when we review the proposals, one of the criteria that, that ranks them higher is if they have matching funds. So they that is something we're looking for. It's not required, but it's strongly recommended. And and I don't I can't think of any recent uh, proposals that were awarded that didn't have some kind of match. So that's a good question. Um, so I also wanted to give you an idea, uh, check in with you since last year about who we awarded funding to and what they did with that money. So last year, uh, we we funded three all ecosystem. I, I'm listing the all ecosystem ones because we'll benefit from it. And then I'll list the three that are specific to GYE. So um, the first, uh, so we did this, uh, we funded this Grizzly Bears of Montana guide, which I'll talk more about um, for the printing. We funded that for $3,000. We funded um, a Defenders of Wildlife um, proposal for $5,000 for electric fencing. And I'll talk more about each of these. And we funded $6,000 to people and carnivores for um, building capacity in grizzly connectivity areas. Those were the all ecosystems or multiple ecosystems ones. And then uh, we also funded an interesting a joint application between the Helena Wood National Forest and the Montana Discovery Foundation. So the Discovery Foundation got six thousand, and the Lewis and Clark Helen Lewis and Clark got twenty five hundred um, for this bridging the gap project, which I'll again talk more about. This is an outreach focused project, um, and then the Jackson District of the Bridger Teton National Forest was awarded three thousand five hundred fifty dollars for. Um, bear food storage and other safety stuff. So those were the, the projects awarded last year, which totaled um, $12,050 for the GYE and um, $16,000 for the multi-ecosystem projects. So for the uh, Bridging the Gap, that the Joint Discovery Foundation and Helen Wilson Clark project, uh, they did 43 days of bear aware outreach work, which included um, preparation for programs, program coordination, training, travel, staff time, and multiple volunteers getting to and from the events. Uh, we also uh, funded this, this great, uh, I wrote your, uh, your end of your summary, did a great job on the, the BT, but they purchased and installed a lot of different bear related signs from picnic table signs to um, more like larger bear aware, third country signs for Forest Service um, lands, picnic tables, occupied areas, campgrounds, and they did a great job leveraging their work with volunteer work as well. Um, and then the People and Carnivores project, they did a lot of different things. I'm going to try to summarize that um, for you here. So the theirs is called Building Capacity for Grizzly Bear Connectivity. Um, they developed community initiatives to prepare uh, communities within and between grizzly bear recovery zones for grizzly bear presence. They scaled conflict prevention resources through outreach education and prevention, um, including a tool, tool loaner program and media 
and expanded their bear safety education and outreach training resources to people living, working, and recreating in Western Montana. Defenders of Wildlife, um, they target about doing about 50 electric fence projects a year. Um, so I don't, I don't, I couldn't find in time how many they did this year, but they average about 50 a year and they've done 531 projects between 2010 and 2020. Um, and then the grizzly bears of Montana, full transparency, I worked on this. So I'm pretty excited about it. And I, I wanted to have a couple copies here for you guys to see. This, uh, this is a, a document that we ended up, we were going to revise it, but we ended up rewriting it. It's a guide that was originally written in 2001. We're like, oh, we'll just update the numbers. But it's kind of a cool story because what we've all realized is the story isn't even the same from 2001 to 2022. So we basically had to rewrite a lot of this to reflect the current status of grizzly bears in Montana. So this is a resource guide written for specifically for teachers so that they can prepare. It's not lesson plans, it's background information. Um, what's the conservation history, management, um, biology of bears. So that's what this is. Um, it's actually, we, we paid for 300 of these for the IGBC funds, but there's also a digital version online at Boone and Crockett Club's website. There are partners here. They did the graphic design and we also worked with them to write it. So that's another project that was funded by IGBC last year. Okay. I think we got through, oh yeah, and the other things, we plan to distribute these through continuing education workshops for teachers. That's how we plan to get them out to the public. All right, now I wanna start uh, going into a little bit more work that each of the states and agencies have done, but I wanna recognize first that all agencies involved in grizzly bear recovery are doing some outreach. So if I don't mention exactly what you guys are doing, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to, to say it because I wanna make sure everybody uh, gets recognized for the work that they have been doing. But I'm trying to be, be brief here. So uh, first off, I was going to talk all about Wyoming, but Rick covered it great. So Kyle sent me that same good summary. Um, in Montana, both Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and the Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the Forest Service, are the primary agencies doing grizzly bear outreach. But the Fish and Wildlife Service has been super helpful this year, especially as Hillary was saying, folks on the ground doing outreach work. Um, we all work together really well in Montana for outreach. Um, so the Helena Lewis and Clark, Custer Gallatin, Beaverhead Deer Lodge, um, we've been working together to provide consistent bear safety messaging at events, trainings, public demos, um, festivals. Um, they have bear technicians working on those forests as well that are doing outreach education, food storage, um, clients. And also training uh, other agencies for, we've worked with Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, BLM, and just making sure all of our staff are on the same page with bear safety as they begin their, their seasons. Um, and then roughly estimating the folks that I've kind of listed here, we've done over 12,000 contacts this season. So a lot of people. Um, and then I know I know Idaho's doing great work. Uh, we talked, I talked a little bit, um, Hillary mentioned it well, like her folks are out there doing education and it's been really helpful for when we didn't have enough time to get to an event you could always call somebody at Fish and Wildlife Service and they would be able to help us out. So that was really nice. Um, and I think that was, that's just a wrap on um, some of the a brief overview of outreach in the States right now. Does anyone have stuff that they want to mention that I didn't touch on even lightly? Because I, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to feel like they didn't get represented. But there's a lot of information going on out here. And, and I'll, I will say that what we we have learned in, in recent years, or maybe it's just my worldview being in this place I am in the world, but it's, we cannot do all of this outreach work on our own. We really rely on our partners. Um, they don't have like federal, state, nonprofit, community members. It's everybody. We all need each other to get the word out. Um, and you don't have to be a bear expert to help your neighbors and family and friends understand bears a little bit better. So to wrap up, I think David covered this but I just wanted to bring it up again. The Bear Smart Community Program is, we don't know yet how it will be implemented, but the executive committee will vote on it in December. So that's like to be determined right now. And then um, David also mentioned this IGBC Education Summit. So um, I don't know how many of you attended the first summit in 2020, but we had a lot of great discussions at that summit in Helena, Montana about the present uh, situation and uh, for grizzly bear information, education and outreach, and what can we do to make it more effective? Who are our partners? 
what are our needs? Um, so one of the things we came up with through that summit was that IGBC would be a great uh, entity to host the next summit because of the fact that so many different agencies and people are involved in this group. So that's on the horizon. Um, we're going to, we're hoping for a spring of 2023 uh, summit, but we have to talk next week when we meet about our capacity to pull that off at time. So we'll let you know. That's that's the status on the education summit. Um, and we'll also be, for anyone who applied for those funding requests, uh, we are meeting on Monday for this committee to go through the proposals and then our executive I, you know, committee is meeting on Tuesday. So we should know next week um, who's, who's giving funding. Yeah, any, any questions? And then the last thing I wanted to, to show is just the reason I handed these brochures out is to, is to give an ex a tangible example of how something like this document, the IGBC's uh, Bear Safety Messages document that the executives voted on in 2020, how something like this can help, um, help us tailor our messaging in the way that's consistent, but also specific to certain audiences. So I have a few of the IGBC publications here. So we have the coloring book. So that's in your pile there. Uh, we also have the bear spray brochure, which was has been updated fairly recently. Um, this is another IGBC publication, um, all consistent messaging. And then this is another, this is a kind of the comprehensive um, bear uh, information pamphlet. So it folds out into a poster. It talks about preventing conflicts, identifying bear sign, activity, uh, storing attractants, all kinds of things. Um, so that those are all consistent with the messaging. And then here are some from Montana as well. We designed a, a flyer for our vacation renter, uh, rental owners to put in their, their homes or just anyone with visitors in Montana. It's kind of the basics of attractants and bear safety. Um, we have a, a pamphlet for farmers and ranchers living in bear country. So specific to their needs. Um, we have a, a little card here just showing kind of basics for recreationists camping and hiking in bear country. And then finally, we have uh, hunting safely in bear country. So it's all specifics on especially managing carcasses, but um, doing the best you can to prevent encounters while hunting. So just so you can see what those are. And if you need more or you want copies of any of these, let me know. I'm happy to share. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, like some of these, like the bear safety ones. So are the agencies themselves paying for printing costs? Who's covering that right We're now? paying for printing? Yeah. Um, so in the past, I know IGBC did pay for some printing, yeah. but I don't know that we're doing that anymore. Do you know, David? Yeah, I don't have, I, I will have to ask, I will have to ask Lori at our, at our, you know, meeting, because I think we largely stopped I printing right. them. Yeah. Like the PDFs are available? So it depends on each version. So I'm happy to share all the Montana stuff with anyone who wants it. You can adapt it for your own usage. That's fine. Um, the green one, the bear safety, this one is actually um, Western Wildlife Outreach is, the, is in charge of this one. So you have to reach out to them for printing and that's theirs. Um, but it is like, we, we weighed in heavily on the last revision of this. So this is like very up to date, good information. Um, and then the, Coloring book and the bear spray brochure are both documents we own at IGBC, like paid for these to be produced. So somewhere lives a copy, we can get these printed. Anyone can print them. And these, this is on our website and this one should be, yeah, find it. So, but this, this should be on our website for download and printing as well. So that, yeah, that's the only, it kind of varies by what, yeah. what brochure it is. But I'll, I'm also working on a guide. Every spring, I try to do a guide of uh, which brochures are still relevant um, and how to get them. So at least, um, and, and and acknowledging that the Park Service has, you guys have your own suite of brochures too, so. Thanks. Again, yeah. yeah. How do you distribute like the pamphlet to the BRBO type of people? Uh, How does that get I think um, so with this we we shared it on social media and we're posting it on our website um, and I would love ideas to get this more directly to people because I haven't maybe some of you have had success the, the companies that run those like big they're not super receptive to small asks like that but maybe they would be if you guys had the right contacts so 
um, that's how what we've done so far. We did a social media post and I shared it with all the contacts I could think of in Montana and beyond. So happy to have new ideas on distribution here. Anything else for Danielle? Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we are ahead of schedule. Um, we're scheduled for a break right now. So let's go ahead and come back. Let's come back at 310. That gives us 20, a 20, little bit longer break. So we will come back when the break is actually scheduled to start. Three times. Okay. 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 Okay.